Andrew Gilhurt, welcome to iCatch Killers. Thanks very much for having me on, Gary. Look forward to our time together. Yeah, well, it's good. Uh, now, you're uh, you're recording in uh, Perth. I'm in, in Sydney. How's Perth today? It's good, mate. Winding into spring. Uh, looking forward to uh, shifting gears into, into summer, mate. So we're all good over this side. I, I, I spent a lot of time in Perth. I lived over in Perth for uh, quite quite a while, and uh, I like love the place. It's got a good feel about it. Yeah, it's pretty laid back over here. They say we're the most isolated city in the world, mate. So I, I think uh, it's a good spot. A good spot to be. <laughs> there's definitely there's definitely some isolation in there. That you're not a local unless you've been there for a very long time. But uh, I have very uh, fond memories of the long, hot Perth summers and uh, well, very it, short it winters. Good, it's, it's a good secret to have, mate. We're um, you know, it's a it's a big country town city really over here, and um, you know, roads are a treat. Our beaches are a treat. So yeah, keep, keep the secret to yourself, mate. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Well, we won't uh, dis- discount what I've uh, what I've just said. That's right. Look, just jumping straight into it. Um, you know, you were shot in the chest and shot in the neck. You're lucky to still be here. You're a sniper in the army. You understand the damage that when metal hits flesh, what can be done. Do you consider yourself lucky to be here? Uh, it's, a, it's a running joke, Gary. It's, uh, you, you survive the army without being shot. You, you get out of the army and get shot. So uh, there's one for you. But um, yeah, look, I do consider myself. I guess lucky is is a is a uh, is a term that we can use loosely. And I like to take the perspective that nothing happens for no reason. Uh, so I've made great sense of 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 being shot, and and obviously, uh, you know, I guess the circumstances that led to me being in that in that situation. Uh, lucky to survive, of course, being hit that high up in the chest and and once through my neck. So, um, you know, the gentleman that let fly that evening uh, let six shots go. I cop two. Um, the the guy next to me uh, cop one, and an innocent young lady in the night in the nightclub cop one in the back of the neck, but that was a ricochet um, off, a, off a cement pillar. So look, we're all lucky that night and lucky to be standing here. But again, it's a, it's a, it's a privilege and it's my passion now to articulate my journey um, and situations like that without being emotionally connected to them anymore. But yeah, I'm, uh, I'm living a blessed life. Gary. Yeah. I understand what you're saying and you're quite right. Ch- uh, checking the word uh, luck. It, it, sometimes it feels like fate, but uh, you, you would have an appreciation that, uh, you know, half a centimetre this way or half a centimetre that way, it could have been the difference. It's uh... Yeah, absolutely. I mean, laying there, Gary, and my army training, I looked down at the at the bullet wound and it was it was bubbling from my chest, so I knew that my lung had been hit. So I placed my, you know, one side down to the ground, uh, knowing that, you know, there was a potential for my for my lungs to be filled with blood and that I would actually drown before I got to the hospital. So it's all the, all the, the training did kick in and, and, and certainly helped me um, on the on the evening uh, so yeah uh, again it was a it was a time where I did actually think you know is this the end for me uh, yeah. and I ended up blacking in and and, and blacking out uh, and sort of thinking that yeah I guess this this was the moment as an eerie peaceful feeling too uh, at that at that point in time and I had a, a number of surgeries to get through that and yeah I was lucky to come out the other side and 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 be up and running and touch wood no no health concerns after it so well, we're going to uh, take a deep dive into your life, but I imagine a, a point in time like that, there's a lot of time for reflection, looking back and what might have been and uh, all that. But it, it, it's quite quite interesting. What I also find interesting, and we, we get, as I said, we're going to delve delve deeply into your life, but you've come from a uh, army environment, which is uh, very much about discipline, rules, regulations, you know, jump how high, yeah, that type of situation. Then you've uh, started to devil, uh, dabble, devil. It might have been the right word. I might have meant that. <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah, dabble in the that, yeah. uh, dabble in the other side of it, and started to associate with outlaw motorcycle uh, gangs. And part of their their stick is that uh, we're rebels. We don't uh, we don't abide by society's norms. Can you um, see the difference in it and explain how you went from one to the other? Yeah, it's an inter- interesting transition. But if we go back, um, you know, as a kid and living a fairly, I guess I've always had that discipline in me and, and, and a drive and always knew that I was a little bit different in that, in those terms. So I was up training in the morning and I had this, this focus in terms of my sport um, and the um, 
just the way I handled myself and applied myself to sport, not so much school, but sport specifically. So I had that sense of discipline and, you know, we moved 11 times uh, in the one town uh, when I was a kid. So that, there was a little bit of um, non-structure there, but for me to join the army was a savior at that time. Cause I was, I, I felt lost and you know, my life had come to a point where I was, you know, had a really bit of a dead end job. I had aspirations to be a pilot, but could never apply myself at school. So in joining the army, I, I really, I, I I had a high level of success when I when I first got in there. Just the mental and physical yeah. discipline uh, and the structure, I really related to that, and it got the best out of me. Uh, so I achieved a lot in a very um, short space of time. Uh, you know, in terms of being selected, you know, for representative squads and 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 really shining um, as a soldier. And it wasn't until later on that you know I started to rebel against that discipline and that structure when I bought out. I was actually trying to get to the SAS. Uh, and they knocked me back, uh, not on my physical, but it was the first year that they'd introduced psychological testing and I didn't meet that profile. Yeah. So once I lost the SAS dream, uh, uh, I was shortly after that application, I was sent to East Timor um, and did a, a four month stint over there as a, a wave of the first soldiers that were to land on the ground. We actually handed over from the SAS. So once that dream was gone and I'd done my overseas active duty, uh, I just felt that I'd achieved everything in in that in the army, and I was the highest level achieving soldier that you could be outside of the SAS in my eyes. Yeah. And I now had active active service under my belt as well. Um, we operated on the East and West Timor border as a recon sniper patrol team um, in a highly, you know, oh, it was um, a volatile time. It, it was. Time. It was. Yeah. It was a very stressful environment. So yeah, coming home uh, after that period of time, I, I got out fairly shortly thereafter, and had signs of PTSD, but again, like you've touched on, I revolted against the structure. So yeah. I was, I was that rebel. I was, my hair was let down. I was, I was getting out, I was going home and yeah. So there was that, there was, there was that time and, and obviously led to what you've touched on earlier and uh, happy to dive into that too. Yeah. Well, it's a, it's certainly an interesting, uh, interesting journey to, uh, where you've, uh, where you've got to, uh, got to now. Um, you you touched on your childhood moving uh, moving eleven times in seven years or or whatever. I, I think you uh, you came from a uh, broken family. Your your parents uh, separated uh, at, at an early age. Yeah, I was seven when my parents split up. Uh, yeah. It did have a profound effect on me. Mum went looking for love in all the wrong places. But yeah. look, I didn't have the worst childhood, Gary, compared to to others. But you know, I I, I listened to a renowned coach. Uh, in a in a seminar, describe his trauma of his dad uh, berated him one time for having a go at hitting nails into a, into a block of wood, uh, and he wanted to be like his dad, of course. And his dad ripped over after he hit his finger and just tore him to shreds. And that later on led to him feeling that you know he's had a really low self worth, and later on became suicidal, and then became this fairly renowned coach. And I was listening to him talk about that and. You know, it really made me understand that trauma and, and, our, and our childhood influence on our later life can't be, there's no comparison. It's just very relative. Yep. So I didn't have the worst childhood, but you know, when mum went looking for love in all the wrong places and led um, us as a family into, you know, family violence and one particular man was a, a very violent um, alcoholic um, yep. and I watched him traumatise mum, beat mum and uh, after one night, uh, he they were arguing and screaming at each other. And I remember we were living in a very small, tiny three-bedroom house. Uh, and she screamed at him, um, I wish you'd go and kill yourself. And we listened to the whole thing. And I just heard him storm through the house and slam the back door. Yep. Um, and I knew, obviously, he's walking to the backyard. So I was looking out of my bedroom window from from my bed. And our, our backyard was lit up by a street light um, just outside our back fence. So I could see everything he was doing, everything that was going on. And... He went into the shed and grabbed a, a length of rope. Um, he scaled the wood yard um, and he strung himself up under the, a large ghost gum tree in our backyard. And um, I watched him hang himself. Um, you know, his body was swinging limp and uh, yep. went into um, fight or flight mode, screamed through the kitchen, yelling at mum, he's done it, he's done it. Gone through and unfortunately grabbed the bluntest knife in the kitchen and scaled the wood yard and, and was uh, trying to cut him down. And mum was there um, holding him up and trying to take the pressure off his neck. And, we finally got him down and mum was able to revive him. We, and we, uh, we, we saved his life that night. And, um, you know, later on, uh, in my young adulthood, I became the product of, of that, that trauma. 
uh, and you know learn to box and then I had not just the anger I had a, a means to use that and I became very good at boxing I was in the ring at, at about 11 or 12 years old so we've got this meshing of my my childhood trauma and then the impact that that had on me as a young man and, and into my young adulthood so yeah well yeah a, a situation like that and it's remarkable the impact your childhood and uh, different events have on you and the, the shaping of the person that person you you are but living in an environment like that it, it can't it can't have been nice and I, I appreciate the fact and this very much comes out in the the research i've done done about uh, about yourself that you're not uh not holding your childhood uh, upbringing as a reason that you went off the tracks and you your own own everything that's happened in your in your life but i think you'd have to acknowledge something like that is not what the average child is going to uh going to experience or hopefully the average child's not going to experience with the boxing was that a uh a, a, a boxing always fascinates me anyone that's listened to the podcast and I, I see a lot of people you know become better people because of it and it's a way to channel some aggression and the aggression is better in the ring than out on the street what uh, what drove you to uh to boxing Interesting story that one too because I came home one day with a with a fat a fat eye. I'd been in a fight at school and bigger kid, and he'd hit me after I I goaded him to do exactly that, and he did. Uh, so <laughs> that I came was home with this. Yeah, that's right. Uh, Learn the lesson the hard way on yeah. that occasion as well. But I came home I had this big fat black eye, and, and my my then stepfather said, "Well, what did you do about it, boy?" And I'm eleven year old kid, uh, and uh, I said, "Well, he's bigger than me. I couldn't do anything about it." And he said, "Well, get in the car," and he's taking me down to the local PCYC. And uh, and dropped me off. I've walked in, and there's all you know, a room full of or a gym full of um, brilliant young Aboriginal kids. I was the only white guy there, and apart from the coach, and I've yep. sort of walked in timidly. Uh, and yeah, he took me under his wing. I I described why I was there. Um, you know, being picked on and bullied at school because I was a, you know a bit of a smaller kid, but I was also a bit of a smart mouth as well. Um, but just didn't know how to handle that. So boxing uh, became something that I grabbed hold of tightly to be able to, I guess, not just control my own emotions, but to to use as a tool yep. uh, at school. And it became a tool for me later on in life. It was it was a way for me basically to talk. Um, and what I later realized is that was the projection of the anger and the emotion that I'd buried. Uh, and again, dissecting that was was a was a whole nother journey and understanding what I was doing and how I was using and applying boxing. But for me at the time, you know, he threw me in the ring very quickly because I I was taking to it. And again, there was that discipline and that focus behind what I was doing. So boxing became a a significant outlet for me. And unfortunately I used it uh, for all the wrong reasons rather than to curtail my emotion and anger. It was a part of my projection. Uh, but again, I love boxing, and it, and it was it was a, it was somewhat of a saviour. Yeah. Um, but yeah, was, um, I I, I see it as something that gives people that uh, if they haven't got much self worth, it gives a little bit of self worth. And yeah, you've you've just acknowledged you didn't use your skills in a, a good way. You probably used it the for the the wrong thing. But I I think it gives you a bit of a reflective outlook on that now at this stage of your life, looking back. That uh, yeah, you can become a bully if you learn how to fight. But uh, you, I don't see you as a bully now. It might have been at one stage, but uh, so I think it plays a part in shaping the person that you become. Definitely. And looking back on on my journey with boxing, I mean, what would have come of me without that? Um, because it did give me some sense of purpose and, and discipline. And I later on, later went on to become um, a professional fighter and train with some of the best uh, boxers in in the country. Um, trained side by side with you know the likes of Daniel Dawson, uh, Benny Cruz, Daniel Green. Um, trained over at Jeff Phoenix Gym and and sparred with some with some guys over there. So there was that component of life. And uh, when I realised that I didn't want to want to take the boxing journey, being a very individual journey, yeah. I sort of came to realise that it wasn't my actual life passion and purpose, and, yeah. and stepped away. That's it, it. Did my life quickly transitioned into into using that for other means. And I, I never liked to think I was a bully because I was a I was picked on myself, and my skills were only in terms of fighting were used to defend myself but yep. also people that were bullied and picked on so there was there was that aspect i didn't um i, I certainly didn't look for uh look for look for the for weaker the more vulnerable people so yeah uh, i i understand i understand where you're coming from you've left school uh you wanted to be a pilot uh but the uh the 
scores didn't add up uh, with uh, with schooling. I wanted to be an astronaut, but uh, yeah, apparently <laughs> didn't we all? <laughs> I, I didn't have the aptitude for it. Apparently, yeah. um, so what uh, the the army? How did you find your way into the army? And tell me about that experience si- signing up into the army. Yeah, again, I left school uh, before finishing uh, year twelve and found myself at a dead end. Uh, was playing a bit of footy was doing a bit of boxing, but, you know, sort of up in the air as to where I was going. I was doing some uh, landscaping labouring uh, just for a local company and hated the guts out of that. So I was looking for a way out and, and I saw some adverts on TV actually at the time and Dad had, had done some time in the Army and I sort of looked at it as a saviour to get me out of that out of the position that I was in. And, um, yeah, I really took it as a challenge and got me out of that, you know, my local hometown and it was it was an adventure. Yep. So, yeah, I really embarked on that. And as I touched on earlier, really, you know, at that, that time I was young and I was green and I was keen and I just threw myself into it. And it was, um, it was a great part of the journey. Where, where did you do your basic, uh, basic training at? Yeah, so I started off in uh, Wagga Wagga yep. um, and then progressed, uh, left to the School of Infantry. Um, I actually wanted to do something else, uh, go go to the infantry, but I was earmarked with my uh, demeanour. I was earmarked for the inf- infantry quite early on, but ended up being a, a you know something that that suited me down to the ground. So, uh, yeah, got to my battalion up there in Townsville, two RR, yep. um, and yeah, progressed through the battalion uh, really quickly and and into recon sniper uh, patrol um, or platoon up there, and uh, yeah, again wound wound through my time. Tell, tell me about the transition just through the basic basic training, and uh, because I, I know people go in there. Some people it fits like a glove. Other people are mortified by yeah this sort of control, mm-hmm. and it's just not the right fit. They they see it as something else. I take it from what you've said. It, it felt like a fitted like a glove. It just felt right for you. You you flourished in in that in, environment. Over the three months or whatever the basic training is, did it change you as a person? Yeah, I remember I had long hair before I joined and my mates were laughing at me thinking that there's no way I'd survive in the army and I remember walking out in front of them with a with a with a shaver and electric shaver and I shaved all my long hair off and they knew I was serious and I'd been accepted at that point in time. Yeah. I remember being on a bus and the bus rolled into barracks and pulled up and I just remember that this this screaming there's about 5 big burly army soldiers or men out there just screaming at us to get our asses off that bus, get our bags lined up. But I, was, I had my eyes wide open. I was, I'm was, i sure I was in shock and disbelief, but they were absolutely like yelling like they, and they meant it. So we were all just doing exactly what they sort of said. And it was that shock and awe campaign and we all lined up. And from there it was, yeah, it was, it was, it was like you throw yourself into that world and you're either going to accept it or reject it. And for me, it just made me think, well, I've got two choices, either run or tell them where to go and yeah. and, and not, re- and not I guess, resonate or not react to that journey. But yeah, for me, I threw myself in and the days were very structured, very disciplined, but every day was a, was a challenge. And for me, I found different parts of myself every day. I, I, I felt that I wanted to push the limit. As hard as they pushed me, I wanted to show them that they were, they were not going to break me. So that was the that was the basic training is the time where you can, for me it was it was an opportunity to shine and use all of my my strengths and my mental strength for for my benefit and and again it really helped me to shine in that environment I got um, the best shot um, in Kapuka which is initial training and then um, best at PT in in my cohort so again just standing out in terms of the way I was applying myself through basic training and then later on into my um, my battalion journey. Yeah, I, I can imagine how it would have uh, would have felt right to, right for you and give you some uh, purpose. And just when you relay in your personal story, I remember I, I put my my son did uh, full time army and the the training, and I remember him getting on the bus and uh, waving goodbye. And I'm thinking you've got no idea <laughs> what you're about to walk into. I know what yeah. bastardisation is, and I knew the environment yeah. he was going into. Yeah. yeah. Anyway, have a good time. And, yeah. yeah. Uh, but I, I got to say, by the time uh, the passing out parade, it changes the person for the better. And uh, yeah, I, I think there's there's a lot of benefits now. People, you know, are going to shout us down and going, "Ah, oh, well, what's the army about? It's about fighting." But there is benefits that come from it: discipline, pride. And uh, I mm, saw uh, I saw him change, and and I saw the friends that he made in there, and they're still lifelong long friends that yep. he's uh, he's kept from his time time in the army. Uh, the bond is unbreakable. Uh, what you go through and 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 what you share, 
um, bonding together again through those challenges. It, it is, it's, it's life changing. And, and I, I do believe for the better too. I had, I had some challenges in, in there, of course, like, like we all do, but um, I was laughing to myself when you're saying that story. Um, I can imagine you're preparing your son, like, you know, you want to give him some sort of experience of what <laughs> yeah. it's going to be like, but it'd be, uh, it'd be interesting. Well, for, I, for I, even, even the physical training I've gone, look, <laughs> one thing we can prepare you for is, yeah, get the kilometers in your legs, get your, yeah, yeah, the yeah. chin ups and push ups, yeah. get ready for it. And, uh, yep. you're just uh, wave, <laughs> waving off, have fun. Mm. Anyway, you'll, yeah. you'll, you'll survive. Okay, so you looked at the the army as a career. You went into the infantry. Um, you got into uh, reconnaissance and sniping. Talk me through the the process there. What uh, what drove you to that uh, that area? Because that's uh, the sharp end. That's the front line. Yes, I got to my battalion uh, and within the first couple of months, there was a battalion military skills. There's like 500 soldiers that compete. Uh, I got the top 10 in that, which was pretty unheard of for um, what they used to call us as a lid. Uh, when we first got to the battalion, you, you just a lid, so you you you're fairly disrespected. Uh, I wasn't a, a soldier that was going to take that approach or or take that from my my fellow soldiers. So I sort of stood up to that um, that treatment, especially, and outshone the more senior soldiers in terms of our, uh, the physical and the way I was applying myself as a soldier. So yeah. um, I, I shirked that um, that term fairly quickly. And I, I remember the first week that I arrived in my battalion. Uh, they when when they get a new um, acceptance of new soldiers, they they give them a baptism of fire. We load our packs up. They don't think they're very fit. They haven't got what it takes. So they take them up the mountain at, at Townsville, and uh, we got up uh, in the morning. They said, "Pack your packs. We're going for a walk." And it was one of the first days I was there. We're, we're walking in a group of twenty, um, and the the corporal's pushing everyone to see how hard we can go. And as fast as he would walk it was as fast as I was going to walk. Um, and it ended up me and him being up the front and getting up to the, the top of the mountain uh, before everyone else, which um, caught everyone off guard. And they thought that I'd uh, I'd unpacked uh, yeah. or, or lightly packed my pack. So in front of everyone, they wait for everyone to go, get up there. And then they called me forward and said, empty your pack out. So empty my pack out. And I actually had more than what they, what they had on the list to, yeah. uh, to be there. Um, so they quickly realized that, you know, I, I was someone that, you know, was going to stand out and was earmarked for other competitions um, after the, the military skills competition and getting in the top 10. Um, there was a, um, a, an, a defense force wide competition called the Dog Squad, uh, where, uh, you know, you get to try out for a section of five or six guys from the the battalion which would go away and be tested against other sections and other um parts of the the, the defense force i was selected in that selecting the battalion obstacle course so yeah uh, obviously that leads to being selected for the more you know tier one roles within the battalion and for me the the, the tier one role was being a reconnaissance sniper soldier which is the most highly trained and um most highly disciplined a part of our battalion that that I aspired to, uh, so yeah, I was I was, I think, I don't want to say that it still stands today, but I was one of the quickest soldiers to be picked to to be even to even get on the course, yeah. the recon sniper course, um, and then progressed into recon snipers um, fairly soon after. So, yeah. So I, I would imagine, and, and talking through your career like that, that there's. It has to give you a self a sense of self satisfaction. This is what I'm meant to do. This is what I'm capable of doing. And everyone, yeah, whether we we acknowledge it or not, likes to be good at something and find find something that you're uh, you're good at. I I think in today's society, like it, it's interesting just talking through the processes of the army. It's competitive. It, it's competing against each other. It's pushing you to the point where you can break. I don't know for what it's worth. I don't think that's a bad thing. I think it it helps everyone. Um, that type of uh, that type of uh, pressure. Your thoughts? I I my perspective on that now is completely and utterly different. I'm very very thankful that I had that experience because again, every, uh, my perspective now is everything happens for a reason. What I've taken from that has has allowed me to, I guess, understand the components of myself and and be the fullest and you know complete expression of the man I was always born to become. And that was just a part of my journey. Um, the, in terms of the competition and and the more fundamental aspects of of using the army to curtail um, and, and you know, basically use war and violence to solve yeah. our issues, I, I have a, you know, we can dive into that, but I have a completely different perspective of that these days. However, 
yes, I do believe as an individual, it, it did allow me to build certain parts of my character um, and reinforce certain parts of my character that that was to set me up later and later on in life, and still do today. The, yeah. the 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 way I understand discipline and how that allows me to be a full and complete expression of myself, um, yeah, it, it, that's still the the components of my life that I live with today and still apply. Uh, so yeah, I, I, there's absolutely con- components of that experience that that are highly positive. Yeah. Um- on the issue of uh, you trained to become a sniper, if if you get deployed, if you use your skills, you you basically uh, you're going to be uh, killing someone. Yeah, that that's uh, that's the the role invariably of, of a sniper. Did you reconcile that in your own mind? What what you were signing up for? Yeah, absolutely, and it's a very very quick realization once you're learning how to use a you know every sort of weapon under the sun from a from a, a handgun right through to a rocket launcher, a shoulder fired rocket launcher, you, you become known that that's what you're, you're training for. It became real to me when we were, we, you know, our camp was what's called a closed camp and we, um, we started to become uh, aware that we were going to be deployed um, and we, we, you go under, under really intense training and you, you get to learn the rules of engagement and, and when you're legally allowed to take someone's life and when you're not. So all of our training all of a sudden became real and, and yeah. you can't not think that here we are, we're about to fly out. You know, we're going to secret bunkers um, and loading up with all brand new weaponry and here we go, we're going to war. Um, very, very quickly becomes something that you think a lot about um, and you do, you have to come to terms with it because at the end of the day, that's your job and being young and being highly trained and being told that you're about to be deployed. Yeah. Um, yeah. It was, it was, you know, it was, as, it was as, as exciting as it was scary at the time, but yeah, having to take someone's life is absolutely something that you've got to come to terms with. Yeah. Yeah. Because that, that's what the, uh, the training revolves around when you were deployed over to East, East Timor, I, I think we were over there from 1999 up until 2012 in, in different levels. But, uh, the initial deployment was the largest deployment since Vietnam to East Timor when that happened. What, what year did you go over there? You went over early in the deployment? That's right. We were the first soldiers um, on the ground. Uh, we handed over from the SAS. Uh, there was a notice we, from the government that, you know, obviously Australia was going to get involved. And then we uh, we had a closed camp. So everyone, you know, you, some guys would live off, off base. Uh, for me, I was living um, on base. So they closed camp and we started to watch very closely um, the unfolding of, of what was happening over there. And um, we got the notice that we were getting prepared to move um, and then got shipped up to Darwin and, and armed to the teeth with what we were going to get deployed with. And when they hit the green light, we were, we were gone. So we were the first, again, we were the first soldiers over there. So um, again, it, it was it was a significant uh, decision that we knew by our government because we had at the time John Howard came to our base and said, "Look, you guys are you guys are off. Um, we we wish you luck with the deployment." And we were deployed under what was called war a warlike situation. So it wasn't peacekeeping; it transitioned to peacekeeping yeah. um, later on down the track. But it, we were we were told this is a warlike situation, and the the situation that we were, were prepared for was that if Indonesia didn't like us to be in their com- in their country, then it was the Indonesians that we were going to go to war with. Um, and through the sights of every single one of our rifles, we had the pressure of knowing that if we were to take an Indonesian soldier's life and be under threat from them, that it couldn't end up in, in war, basically. So, yeah, there was, there was a lot of pressure, but we were, again, we were highly trained and we were, um, we were ready to do what we had to do. But it is, there, there's so many aspects to it. How old were you at the time? Yeah, I was um, 19 when I got deployed. <laughs> you, look, you look back now and you think what a kid you were, how naive you were, and there you are at 19 in a pressure situation like that. With uh, And you didn't really know what you were going to walk into at uh, no. with the East Timor situation with Indonesia, and it really was a powder keg. And I think everyone was looking at it with uh, with trepidation about what would what would happen there. So you've, you've in the army, you've been trained up for this, then you've got deployed into a conflict zone like that. What was that experience like? Yeah, so getting on the ground, a lot of lot of buildings burning, uh, and for us as recon sniper, we wanted to secure the uh, the the landing zone. We we did that. Uh, as soon as the rest of our, our battalion flew in, we were shipped off um, to the east and west Timor border to secure 
the border from where the the TNI, which were the Indonesian militia, were coming over to to um, you know, rape, pillage, and murder the local East Timorese. So we were on the front edge, and it, our our um, our motto was forward of the um, forward of the forward edge of the battle area, uh, which is where we were. So we got into hives, we we hid, uh, we tracked. Um, and we tried to locate and and stop these um, the T and I coming over the border. And there was many times where we caught them doing so. Uh, and for me personally, my journey was that we thumped our safety catches off an, a number of times and were prepared to kill uh, and issued warnings uh, and came very very close. Uh, one particular time, the T and I were coming down as a patrol, um, and one of our guys was spotted in in a creek bed, um, and they turned and ran, and we were seconds away from being given the order to open up we're just waiting for them all to come into the creek bed uh, and for me personally it was almost like and i don't i don't want anyone to judge this because i've had to go through this thought process but in not actually releasing bullets and even if it took a life or not it didn't matter but being wound up to that point so often on the border um, and being so isolated and having so much pressure to take that shot and waiting for that for the for the call to open fire and and actually not doing it it's almost like for four months we, we lived in a constant state of anxiety without having that release uh, and yeah when i got home it, it did it had a profound effect on me and i realized later on just how wound up i'd i'd become and and you know i was already a fairly angry anxious kid and now here I was being put in this situation and having no release. So being dumped home on the other side and there being no transition back into what is normal life, it, it really did had had a, a profound effect on me. I, I think you explained that well, Andrew, because quite often people look at, OK, well, how, how did it impact? Was there any skirmishes? Was there conflict and that? But you're at a high level of, you know, you're a moment away from that exact thing happening. And I always think, you know, the confrontation at the level that you're talking about, the pressure leading up to it, sometimes you just want it to start. <laughs> like it, yeah. it's easier just to deal with it. Other than worrying about what might, it, might happen, you prefer to just go into fight mode and, uh, and get it done. So I can understand the profound effect it would have on yourself and the other people in, involved in those situations. Yeah, you described it well, Gary. It's, it's just like we wanted this release um, and then having the opportunity to obviously reflect on that. Um, you know, it's hard to reflect at the time. You mean you're just yeah. dealing with it. Uh, but that was actually the truth. And the East Timor became, and I think still is, the highest uh, suicide rate of any deployment in terms of the, the ratio so it did it you can see the, the profound effect that it did have on on the guys over there and um you know i, I always looked at vietnam I, I i thought vietnam veterans and you know watching what they went through and you hear about you know we're taught about the battle of long tan all these all these really monumental battles and we because we didn't um i guess take action or shoot anyone we we just thought that we couldn't put ourselves in the same category as a vietnam vet but yeah. here we were getting you know infantry combat bad badges for warlike situations and 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 all these you know active service medals and you know you sort of try and put yourself in in a vietnam veterans shoes because they got the same accolades and yeah we're like well it doesn't really make sense but at the same point in time you know we were in that that situation but not having the release that that sort of they did and obviously that brings a whole nother set of circumstances but looking at it from our perspective and, and not having you know had that chance to release it was yeah a big component of that experience that i i took away and, and reflected on yeah i can i i can seriously understand how how it plays it plays with your head coming back and then you come back into society and you basically just drop back like there would be a you know decompression that period I, I would imagine but basically then you got to come back and function in uh, in society normally yeah yeah and when i got back i was thinking you know for the month i got back there's no real big debrief there was no let down it was just hey you're back now and and we get on with life and um, and that's what was the ex expectation at that time and um i got back out and you know really thought because of my training because of you know what i'd achieved and then obviously uh, wanting to go into the SAS and having that dream taken away, yeah. uh, it was like I've achieved everything that I can possibly achieve. And, and I was coming towards the end of my four-year term of service, which which is mandatory, and thinking that, you know, what else can I achieve here? What am I going to do? And very quickly decided 
um, that the regime and the discipline and the structure just uh, no longer was making me happy. It was actually challenging me. Um, so yeah, made the decision to to move on and go back to my hometown. And at the time, my brother was uh, mixed up in some things, and uh, I actually went back home to to save him, to rescue him, and to help him out of his situation. And uh, got sucked into it, and I really wasn't in after my term of service. I had some stuff to deal with myself, uh, and yeah, it wasn't until later on that I I realised how quickly I did get home from East Timor and then transition and wanting to get out and then and then landing at home and then everything sort of, all the components to sort of juggle coming together. Sometimes those rush decisions are not the, not the best, are they? No. When you, okay, no. I hate this, I'm out of here and uh, yeah, let, let's move on. Yeah. You're, there's a book that you've written a chapter in uh, called Moments in Time and it's a great book, uh, The Chance to Change by uh, Change Everything. And uh, I just want to read out a quote uh, you're talking about yourself after you came back from uh, East Timor. So it might sort of articulate what, you, what you've been saying. I was just discharged from the army shortly after returning from East Timor, even more angry and disillusioned than ever. Compounding, my issues were now symptoms of post-traumatic stress. I embarked on a mission to break free from the discipline and structure of the army, and very quickly my life became more and more out of control. I lived from weekend to weekend, partying, and began dealing drugs to facilitate my lifestyle. Like, it's a radical change, isn't it? You, you're there, you're in the army, you've been deployed, representing your country, and you, you've come back here and you, you're angry. And uh, are, you, are you looking for purpose? I'm just trying to get a sense of what, what steered you that way. I, you said you went down to help your brother. Yeah, I did. I My brother was tied up in um in a lifestyle that i had no idea about at the time but i remember he called me one time and said listen i've been i've been king hit and you know you don't touch my brother um, yeah so i i became irate i said mate i'm coming home now he said look you've got a month or so to go get out do your time and and come home and we'll sort it out and and that i did i remember flying in the first weekend and um seeking out the the guy that hit him who was a bouncer at the time and um called him out and that's where um, I was exposed to the lifestyle that he was leading. And again, being already angry and wound up and having not dealt with anything, I was just this volatile human being looking for a place to belong and a look, looking for a new future and a new direction. And what I was exposed to, I, I remember being exposed to, um, you know, a, a guy came out into our, uh, over to our house one time and he got out a, a, a big duffel bag and, and opened the zipper up and there was a handgun, hundreds of thousands of dollars, thousands of thousands of ex ecstasy tablets and and kilos of, of, of speed and at the time. And, and I just looked at it and my, my eyes just opened. It was like, you know, here's this this guy who's saying, you know, basically you can have what I have if, if you want to do what I do. Uh, and, you know, I was disillusioned. I was looking for, again, of course, the army gave me that that brotherhood and that belonging. And I'd always been a bit that way, all about my mates and getting outside of home and I had my footy and boxing. And um, so, yeah, I guess the the logic behind it is that here I am, a young man, young, young bull, young buck. I'm out. I've got my freedom. I can do what I want when I want. Um, and that was a big, a big part of my life at that time because I'd had enough of the discipline and the structure. So I was just ready to let fly. Um, and then being exposed to that, it was a big door of opportunity that I just stormed basically straight straight through. I, well, you've been very honest in uh, in what what was attracting you there. I'm wondering if it, it runs deeper. You get out of the army, you're looking for that adrenaline rush, you're looking for purpose. It, like, what was it that you thought you were going to get uh, going down that path? Because there's a risk associated. The high level of anx anxiety that you're feeling in uh, East Timor. And the alertness that you had to be hyper vigilant, you start delving into the underworld and uh, drug dealing, and that you, you're going to be feeling that way the whole time. Well, that's exactly right. And uh, for me, living on the edge because I've just come out of uh, you know off the back of East Timor and all my training, and and it was to me it was it was normal to some degree. So it it, it was an attraction. It was it was basically a, another means that I could continue living life on the edge and seek that next thrill um, and match the emotion that I was feeling inside. And uh, yeah, it did. It was, it was, it was an attractive lifestyle to me at, at that time. Did uh, anyone close to you, like your, your brother was in that world, but th was there anyone, friends or uh, relatives, anyone that sort of gave you a tap on the shoulder and said, mate, what are you doing? Absolutely. My, my dad, you know, he's a very, very, 
uh, staunch advocate for working hard and we've got three generations of a family in Collie and you know we we built basically the, the the southwest we had one of the biggest engineering businesses at the time and our family is entrenched in and uh, you know in its reputation for what we've been able to achieve so for what i did and, and the direction that i took had a, had a great impact on on him and his his beliefs about what i shouldn't shouldn't be doing with my life and you know he 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 did everything he possibly could to try and let me know that you know he wasn't going to support that journey and and that i should make different different decisions for myself absolutely um outside of dad there was you know mum was going to love me either way anyway um but really i didn't have any other male role models in my life and uh, unfortunately even even dad you know when mum and dad broke up we I don't see him every yeah. you know couple of weeks and then we're lucky if even if that so really it was it was just me kicking my own tin down the road so to speak and and you know my decisions were my decisions and i was i was comfortable and happy making them my way because i that's the way it always was for me since the age of a boy do you think anyone could have made a difference to you at that stage or, or was it virtually a path you had to you had to learn your lessons the hard way no look there was a couple of times where i veered off and and tried to break away from the lifestyle I, I moved up north and got a job and tried to assess the situation because i knew it was sucking me in fairly deeply i had a chance to reflect and there was another time where i i took my passion for flying and um was uh went on a um a, a joy flight in a mig fighter jet and the the pilot said look if i can get you if i if i if i can't get you to pass out i'll give you a free flight in my my dog fighting um, little jet trainers and he um he couldn't get me to pass out so I went for a fly in the in the jet trainers and he said mate you 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 need to be flying he said i want you to come with me so we went on this journey and i started studying and i got my pilot's license and and that was another time where it was you know there was a pull away from that lifestyle and and uh, long story short he he sort of you know, advocated that there was a future there for him and uh, for me, and there wasn't. So that fell away. And then I was, I was always going back to it. It was just this, just this thing that I, I couldn't escape. And um, so, yeah, in, in the end, I guess looking at it, it's just uh, it's a journey that I had to take. And yeah. when I decided, there was a time where I was hanging around, I was involved in you know drug dealing. I was involved in living that lifestyle, and that led me into the arms. I actually started fighting. Outlaw Motorcycle Club members um, on the street uh, because, you know, I was my own crew. And um, so, yeah, we had some issues there, but I was introduced to them. And and then I was knocking on their door a lot more and, and drawn into their lifestyle. So there was a progression from what I was doing. And, um, and, and that was another whole level up for me in that lifestyle. And um, I remember coming to a choice where I said, you know what? I've, I've hung around, I've questioned this for long enough and I'm, I'm diving in. So, um, I, that was the time I put my hand up and became a nominee member of one of the, right. the, the staunchest outlaw motorcycle clubs in Australia. Do you think, um, are you a bad guy trying to be good or are you a good guy trying to be bad at that stage of your life? No, look, I, I have always maintained that what I was standing for, even though there was delusions and there was, you know, a lot of, um, erroneous decisions in there tied up in, in obviously the trauma that I'd experienced and the, you know, the deluded lifestyle, yeah. of course, but I was not someone that would go around looking for trouble. I wasn't someone that would, you know, deal drugs to a, a, a school kid or, or, or do anything that I thought at that time was outside of my own moral compass. Uh, mind yeah. you, here, we, here I am, uh, uh, you know, dealing drugs and I later on, I'm, I'm not justifying it all because, you know, I, I've, the, 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 the journey of forgiveness and understanding um later on for me was an incredible healing journey and 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 i understood that dealing drugs in, in its entirety was was an absolute um uh something that was wrong not just on, on society but on myself so but at the time we're speaking about uh yeah i, I thought i was someone that was a, yes choosing to live this lifestyle but living within some form of, of moral compass yeah I look I appreciate your honesty because I, I think the depth of your story needs to, needs to be told and understanding where where people are coming from but yeah you strike me as, as someone with empathy you, you're reflective and all that and I'm, I'm trying to think who was this person at the time where drugs because you you, you can't be naive to the fact that drugs cause harm in society and individuals Absolutely. and you're profiting off, off that and I'm, I'm trying to see 
how someone that was sitting opposite me now was reconciling that with his own conscience and moral compass at the time that you were doing it. Look, I just want to touch on that, and I appreciate that too, Gary. It, it, it does mean a lot, and I haven't become the man I am today and, and living my passion and my purpose lightly. Um, it's a, yeah. a, you know obviously we're going to talk about that, but if I can just address that, um, you know, it's again we don't you don't fall into this journey, you don't you don't recover from this journey lightly, and it's an absolute uh, pleasure and a privilege for me to dive in deep and to be completely authentic and completely, you know, living from a place of integrity in terms of what I did do, what my previous life was. But I'm not the sum of my past mistakes. I'm the sum of the lessons learned. And that's a very conscious choice that I, that I have, have that I apply to my life. And it was in my own vulnerability and, and learning that here I was this wannabe hard guy, tough man, um, you know, and, will tell this story but it was through me becoming vulnerable having strength in vulnerability and leaning into my own fear to discover that that was the very catalyst and the very key to my freedom and later on down the track going to prison was you know i've said this many times and my truth is that i was sent to prison to be set free Uh, and i was i became set free and there's only one prison that we live in and that's the prison of our mind um, so it's been a profound journey and we're talking about my past. I've dealt with that effectively. I've, I've taken complete and utter ownership um, and have gone through a period of forgiveness and, and putting everything back into context to put myself back together. And I call it reconciling myself yeah. to myself. Um, so yeah, an incredible healing journey. And I'm, I'm not connected to my past anymore. Again, an effective healing journey means I can reflect on my past without applying an emotional perspective to that past. It was what it was. I'm not proud of a lot of what I did. I don't sit here advocating for crime or or drug dealing or drugs or all that or glorifying that lifestyle. Uh, I've progressed from that. And, and again, I'm not proud of a lot of it, but I'm proud of the man that I've become and how I've put that back into context. Yeah, well, I, I think yeah, people are not going to learn unless people are prepared to talk about their journeys and uh, their own experiences. And I think that's why what you've got is so powerful the way that you uh, the way that you talk about it. You talk about um, yeah, you started to stand up the bikies and uh, get into punch ups with bikies or, or whatever. That I, I I know the the culture that would attract some interest there, and uh, yeah, well maybe it's easier to get him into the fold and all that so you were spiraling into a world that you knew that uh yeah they've got their code their own code but by society's code it's not the uh not what most of us uh most of us live by did you see yourself um changing did you ever have a time where you look in look in the mirror and go what the fuck what am i what am i doing here not at the start at the start you know i was very keen on with everything that I was applying myself to, it was all in or nothing. So for me, I wanted to become a leader in that area and I wanted to exact my own, uh, I guess, leadership and my own application of that lifestyle um, to the people around me. Uh, and I'd always been looked at um, by my peer group as, as a leader and, and the go-to and the problem solver. So for me, I found myself being in that position again and uh, I had to start again, obviously, when I progressed into into the Outlaw Motorcycle Club scene. Uh, I don't talk too much about that, and yep. you won't hear too much out of me in that regard. But from my own experience, this is uh, – so I had to start again from the, from the bottom of the pile. But prior to that, again, I was always uh, looked at as, as a go-to and a leader. But, um, yeah, so stepping through that journey, it was um, – yeah, there was there were times I thought, you know, this is getting pretty serious. Um, and what parts of myself am I facing, and and my decisions and choices? Uh, and it wasn't till later on, um, after a couple of years, um, that you know I'd been shot, and um, it was actually, yeah, prison for me was the catalyst. That, um, that, uh, that's sort of when you you've hit uh, hit the bottom. Look, I think, Andrew, we might take a break now and uh, just to give the listener an idea of what we're going to be discussing. And trust me, listeners, this turns around and it becomes a, uh, a nice story. We're hearing a lot of, uh, mm-hmm. lot of heavy stuff, but that's uh, another uh, how you described yourself. And I think it's around this time that we're talking in your life. Uh, I became heavily entrenched in the underworld, which led me to being shot twice at close range in a bikey room 
uh, brawl, once in the chest and another through my neck. I spent a short time as a nominee, uh, nom member of one of the most notorious outlaw motorcycle clubs in Australia and later become the central target of an undercover police operation. That's what we're going to talk about in uh, in part two. And Andrew, I just want to say, I'm seeing the writing on the wall. This is going to end in tears at that point in your life. Like I can see it, step, stepping back. I think Blind Freddy could have seen that, Gary, to be honest with you. Uh, unfortunately, I couldn't at the time. So. <laughs> it's just he- <laughs> heading that way. Well, let's uh, let's take a short break and we'll be back for part two to continue on with Andrew's story.